Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had about... Hey there, folks, and welcome ye all to part 10 of Pillars of Eternity. It's been a little while. I've been engrossed in other such things as Dragon's Dogma and just trying to find time to play two games. Not that I didn't want to play it. Not that I got my ass handed to me in the last game at all. <laughs> anyway, we are where we were, and we... We're going to have a look around this village that we found. So it could be a relatively slow part of this, but we're going to go wandering around, see what's going on in each of these areas. I'm once again just testing the microphone's sound a little bit differently, so let me know if you feel like anything's not sounding right. I'm trying to get it a bit richer by having the microphone closer to me and bringing sensitivities down, all that sort of thing. Right. I also think that we need to do something about our inventory in this particular episode. Oh no, I think we might have sorted it, in fact, now that I've just said that. I'm talking nonsense. We're not too bad. Although we are still carrying a few bits, possibly, yeah. Uh, that we don't have to be wandering around with. And we've got extra party members now as well. There's six of us. All right, team, let us go. Uh, did we speak to these people? I can't recall. Us, we're just minding our own business. We're cooling our heels until Murdrith says job's done. There we go. Medrath, an elf idles by the road, watching the village across the river. He nods as you approach, and the cowled figures standing near him fall silent. Gods keep you. Greetings. A look of horror slowly forms on his face. Blazes. You... you all right, Blazes, you've just come from the village, have you? How bad was it? How bad was what? Haven't you heard? There's a murderer on the loose, said to have gone mad with grief and strangled a dozen healthy children when their own were, uh, when their, when her own was hallowborn. He nods at the figures with him. We've come all the way from Defiance Bay to bring her to justice. She's here? He nods across the river. She's hiding out in the village. We'd go in after her ourselves, but the problem is she knows our faces. There's no telling that she, what she'd do if she saw us coming. And we'd like to avoid any further unnecessary bloodshed. He leans closer. Her name's Nif... 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 Ni, yeah, Nifer. <laughs> Nifer or Nifer. She's an Orlan. We want to get her out of town so that we can deal with her cleanly. She knows we're looking for her, but if someone could, were to convince her that it was safe to leave... Yeah, I'm not sure about this. He nods. She won't know you. It's It'll be simple. I have a few questions for you. Remind me who I'm looking for. An all and woman named Nifer. I don't know exactly where in the village she is, but there aren't too many Orlans around Dale here. Traveller. What did Nifer do exactly? She was responsible for the murder of all those babies in Defiance Bay, remember? Terrible thing. But we'll make her pay, all right? Mm, was she, though? In we go. The better part of valor. Good day to you. And to you, sir. You've recently come to drive Direford. I take it. I don't suppose you saw a young elven noble woman on the road. I am stuck in this wretched place with the rest of my unit until we find her. Uh, I haven't seen anyone like that. Same as everyone else in the blazing village. He sighs. Perhaps you could go speak with Lord Harund at the inn anyway. He'll be grateful for the assistance and it could be the locals... Uh, it could be the locals will open up to you about his daughter's disappearance more than they have to us. Okay.
sure why not. Oh, the beautiful loading screens. We do love them. Have you been to Divine's Bay? I hear there's no Hallowborn there. Or Hollowborn, I should say. Oh, shit. <laughs> Forgot there was no stealing in the, this game. Sorry about that, my friend. I'm going to leave now. Well, that was exciting, wasn't it? Stay outside next time. Ooh, it's like original Skyrim loading times to go in out of buildings. Damn Galloway for monsters like that, and damn the rest of the gods too. Rumbold. A man paces angrily in front of erect animal pen, his sun-weathered face twisted with ire. He's so wrapped up in his fury that he doesn't seem to notice you. Galloway and slobbering beasts, blazing bloody effigy, thrice damned salty wench and her soggy, uh, what's wrong? That monster stole my pigs, traipsed into the village, tore down my pen and made off with the whole damn herd. Just left a few little runts and what am I supposed to do with them? What are you talking about? An ogre moved into the area not long ago. Folk had been seeing glimpses and tracks out in the wood, but it seemed to be staying away from town. Or well, so we all thought until it made off with my pigs. Now everyone's afraid it's going to develop a taste for kith. If it hasn't already. What do you mean now? I know it's too late to get back my pigs, <clears throat> but it had set my mind at ease to see that things had that things had shorn from its neck. In fact, you bring its ugly pate to me, and I'll trade you something that's of less use to a farmer like me than to a rowdy-looking sort like yourself. <clears throat> what do you know about the ogre? It's the same as any other, I'm sure. A big ugly son of a bitch with a nasty temper and an appetite to match. Trigill could tell you more. He claims to have seen it in the wood. You can find him in, the sh in his shop right by the broken tower. I've been sent to find an orland named Niffer. Know where she is? Never heard of her. Yeah, that's a likely story, my friend. A few quests opening up here, isn't there? <laughs> Little pigs. That lord will have bigger problems, the guards pushing us around. Harren's men already asked us about the girl, what more do we want? Bumfrith is pleasant enough, but once you get him talking... <laughs> speak to the pig. Winfrith's arm and armor. Oh, hello. Let's have a look in here. See what he's got in his shop, people. How do, Winfrith? Good day, stranger. Good day to you. A portly, smiling man stands behind a warped wooden counter, polishing a buckler. He looks up. Haven't seen you before. Always glad to see a new face in town. Company's good for business and chatter's good for the soul. That's what I always say. Anyhow, what can I do for you? 
Show me what you have for sale, my good friend. Yeah, it's a bit messy looking at stuff, isn't it? Ooh, nice bows. How much money have we got? Yeah, thought we had more than that. We've got 1,324. Not as much as I'd hoped. So I don't think we'll be buying anything too exciting too soon. Have we got a torch? Don't know if we have. Take one of them. Yeah, I'm actually tempted to retrain my character, you know, and do them as a, a bowman. Keep them out of harm's way. Uh... bit annoying you've got to go all the way to the top of the menu to get to that upper menu. Nice armour there, look. Yeah, the one we've got on seems to be, it's got a worse recovery speed, but it's got better uh, defence on it. That's a unique armor, that one. Recovery speed's good. It's got properties of fine athletic major spellbind. Deterious alacrity of motion. Properties fine. Yeah, I don't know what's so special about the others, it just says properties fine. Ooh, he's got some nice boots, though. Zealous command bonus. Constitution of one in the one I've got. Zealous command bonus, what's that all about? So it costs 500 to retrain. Hmm. Right, I'm not sure if that's going to reset. It's not going to let me change his type, though, is it? Reset Xander to level 1 and assign new attributes, skills, talents, and abilities through level 4. Hmm. Oh, yeah, he is level 4, that's why. I can't remember how it worked. I, I don't know that that's going to change him from what he is kind of thing, rather than just set what he's learned. Where did it go? <laughs> Pretty sure I just bought a torch and now I don't have it. Did I give him it back? That's brilliant, that is. What kind of system is this, people? What? Oh, there we go. Yes, that's it now. It's up there on the top guy, isn't it? Well met, friend. Let's see what he knows about uh, what's been going on in Diaford. 
Oh, we're a quiet little town, not much happens here, especially not since the legacy hit. People realised they couldn't have babies and just stopped trying altogether. And that takes a lot of the excitement out of the day-to-day, -day, if you can believe it. I may well actually just give him a few of these bits that we're not using. Like that. We tried the axe for a little bit. And they decided not to bother, didn't we? Interfering, burning lash and, and rending. Might hang on to it for a bit. So. All right, then out we come. Oh, mind you, who's this in the corner? Let's see what they've got to say. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. There's too much reading involved in those pieces, people. <laughs> Can't be doing with that. Right, what else have we got going on? Can't remember the last time we had any healthy birth in the village. Not many new faces these days, most are eager to leave Diaford. Draco Jenin. See who's talking in there. <clears throat> right then, who's about? Evening all. just want to find her. Surely even you can understand that. We're decent folk, my lord. Perhaps you should leave and check the wilds. How do you do? The innkeeper digs inside a mug with a dirty rag. His eyes under his thick brows are tired but watchful. He gives you the quick nod as you approach the bar. Don't see many travellers these days. Something I can do for you? What was your exchange with that nobleman about? He looks up from polishing the tankard and glowers at the Lord. Folk round here are decent. Uh, folk round here is decent. They mind their own business. You want to stick your nose in it? Go talk to him yourself. I have questions about Diaford. Have you seen an old land called Nefer? He jerks his head at the stairs. Twitchy lady, that one. Tell me about the village. Walk from one bridge to the next and you've seen it. We're quiet, hard-working folk. We keep to ourselves and don't take to being pushed around. He glares at the well-dressed man standing off to the side. Who lives in Diaford? Not many anymore. Hard to keep people around when everyone here is birthing hollowborn. But we got a few who stick around and do business. 
Tigrils, the Leather Courier, Hendiana, Crafts Potions, and Winfred Trades and General Goods. Alright. Tigril. Trigil. Uh, tri I can't pronounce anything in this game. Trigil, the Leather Carrier. Let's see him, don't we? Rumble's a pig farmer. Or was, anyway. Tell me about Trigil. He's a courier. Treats leather and makes armour and a few other goods with it. Problem is, the smell of tallow and deer shit tends to put people off their food. And his shop is right next door. That's handy to know. What's Hendina's story? Lady's a clever hand with potions and postices. Got herself into trouble with a nest of worms or so, I hear. Her cart's on the east end of town. And Winfrith, we've already met him. Been around even longer than I have. Nice enough fellow, but never could quite find his way to end of a sentence. His shops across the square. Something happened to Rambald's pigs, I take it. Damn ogre carried them off. Now he squeals more than his herd ever did. It is rotten luck. Let's go back to my previous questions about Diaford. Have you seen an Orlan? You said you don't see many travellers. Of course not. Why would they come here? We've got bandits on the road and an ogre in the forest. <clears throat> that yapping fool Rumbad will tell you. Worse yet, hasn't been a healthy child born here in over a year. Most kith that come here is just passing through. About the ogre. You don't hardly see him this close to town. Ogres and kith don't mix well. Ugly bastards, but they're smart enough to know that much. You want to know more? Talk to Rumbald, his farm in southwest of here. I just did, yeah. I'd like to hire an adventurer. All right. Let's see what rooms you have. Now, we'll see what the adventurer thing's like. Got a few around here looking for work. Tell me what you're looking for and I'll hunt them down. Level 2 Adventurer, Level 1 Adventurer. No, it doesn't tell you much about them, does it? Alright, so you can do all your party stuff at any end, I assume. And you can sleep if you haven't got any campfires also, I assume. Lord Harrand. The man wears Adia style robes. Simple but elegant. His fine leather shoes look like they were made for padding around indoors, yet they're caked with mud. He yanks at a lock of hair twinted, twined around his silk glo gloved finger. His fine features are etched with anxiety. My child is out there. Do they not understand? 708 experience. My lord, we're doing everything we can. Unfortunately, these villagers... Beasts take them all. I don't care how you do it, but find her. Your child is missing, I take it? Yes, Lady Alice. My daughter. He tugs at the fingertips of his gloves. I've asked around, but nobody in this mud hole has any concerns beyond their swine. They turn my men away like beggars and seem downright pleased to be of no use. But you, you're not one of my soldiers. And you look like you're used to getting your hands dirty, if you don't mind my saying so. Not at all. His guard leans in. My lord, I... <laughs> Why did he just stop talking halfway through? So annoying. If you find her, he nibbles and... Th Nibbles the thumb of one of the silk gloves. Tell her I won't be upset with her. She can come back and all will be well. I just want to make sure my alias, my child is safe. Nothing in the world is more important to me. I'd like to ask a few questions about your Elise. daughter. Of course. Describe Lady Elise. She's a striking woman. Striking young woman, in fact. Bears more resemblance to her mother than me, than to me. She has auburn hair and delicate, well-bred features. She must be, oh, 28 or 29 now. <laughs> Good of him to know. Tell me about her disappearance. We'd stopped in Dyer for a few days. On our fourth evening here, I was making plans to continue our journey. Lady Elise 
was feeling unwell and went to bed. When I retired a couple of hours later, I found that she had vanished. None of my men had seen her go and no one at the end knows where she was. Since then, my people have been combining, have combing the village, but we've yet to find a clue and the locals have been no help. Why did you and Elise come to Diaford? It was merely a stop along the way to Ina's rest. However... She took ill shortly after our arrival, so it seemed prudent to allow her to a few days to recover. What's in Ain's rest? He frowns as if to protest, but he gives in with a sigh. Lady Elise has reached an age where it is prudent for her to marry. Given this legacy business, I can't let her fertile lips slip by, nor do I want her womb to fester with the presence of so many hollowborn. Very, very nice. So she's run away because she doesn't want to marry some old cretin, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> it seems there would be more potential suitors in New Hayamar or New Yama. Where's the rest of your family? Surely they wouldn't want to miss your daughter's betrothal. I see, but going back to your daughter. Lady Harand is ill-suited for travel, I'm afraid, and unfortunately Alice has few other close relatives. My sister and her husband, Alice, Alice's aunt and uncle of course, have been visiting Adaya these past months. And as for siblings, Elise has none. My wife has only given birth to Hollowborn since Elise, that is. You think I haven't considered that? Arranging a suitable match is difficult. The best prospects for my child lay in, in his rest. And going back to your daughter... Back to previous questions. So, uh, I heard arguing with the innkeeper. A petty, small-minded man, just like the rest of them around here. I've been paying him an honest fee for board and bed, and yet he can't be bothered to stir himself to concern for my Alice. This is why I'm hoping you can help. He tugs at the lock of hair again. I should never have trusted these people around my child. Tell me about yourself. I'm Lord Nestor Harrod. Defiance Bay. My family has been prominent there since Imperial times. Our primary estate is on the outskirts of Brackenbury, but we have holdings in New Haymar as well. Those went to my sister and her husband. Fare you well. I think we should have a save as it happens. I had one this whole playthrough. Well, he nodded toward the stairs for this murderer of a woman that seems to be a slaughtering hollowborns. Hello. Nafer. The Orlan hovers by the window, peering out of it every few seconds. As you enter the room, she watches you carefully, her hand hovering over her stiletto. That's a knife, I take it, not a shoe. <laughs> she cranes her head to peer behind you. Anyone follow you? Who sent you? Someone told me you were responsible for heinous killings in Defiance Bay. Let me guess. Was that someone named Medreth? She draws her stiletto. It's a lie. Plain and simple, I got on the wrong side of his employers and now he's after me. But if you're here to do his dirty work, I won't make it easy for you. Relax or attack. <laughs> Relax, I just want to hear your side of the story. What story? The Dominals came after me. I just happened to rob the wrong place. How was I supposed to know they already had claimed it? She runs her hands under her hood and through her hair. It was an honest mistake. I'm just trying to survive now. And if you if you poke with uh, if you spoke with Meredith, you know where he's waiting. Please help me get out of here. Um, go east. Medreth's waiting for you on the west of the river. Two hundred and eighty experience. She nods slowly. All right, I'm trusting you. Don't have much choice. See if you can send him the other way. That should buy me some more time. She follows the hooded figures toward the stairs, giving you a final uncertain glance as she passes the door. 
Seems reasonable. Nice. I can do that. That's settled. Nice. I'm going to get caught stealing. <laughs> you close the door. <laughs> we were never here. There might be somebody in here. Stop it. The glass of this window is broken. Warped knotted planks have been nailed over it. Not very interesting. <clears throat> this painting portrays the expansive foothills below the mountains of White March. This painting depicts a forested ravine somewhere in the Living Lands. Well, that's nice to know. Well, this is a quite little walk around episode, isn't it, eh? It's one of those sorts of RPGs, though. It's in the ilk of Divinity. You can go through a whole hour and a bit of not fighting or doing anything too majorly exciting other than talking to folks. What are you doing in the kitchen? Dengler will get you sorted out with food and drink. Well, that looks like it, folks. Good day, stranger. Oh, hello. Sid. A redhead stands by the fire, tuning her lute and plucking its strings. She hums snatches of a melody as she goes. First time at Dracogen. Normally, I'd have a song ready, but I haven't quite worked out this tune yet. I'm trying to... I'm writing some chants about the founding of this inn. Say, you interested in the story? I haven't finished the chants, but I could tell you about it all the same. Sure, let's have it. No, I've got to read it. It was built in the time of Hadrus Rebellion. An Edrin lady, Thainu, once had a keep here. One of the towers still stands, but the rest is said to be buried under the village. Anyway, she stuck to the side of the Empire and a contingent of Duk Hadrut's Knights of the Crucible helped the farmers and the colonists in the area turn the keep into rubble. What do you mean it's supposed to be? Dire woodens are an, ordin an ordinary lot, and the more these new neighbours met, the more they argued. They realised they didn't agree on much beside out uh, ousting the old lord. The biggest divide was over the, Glanth uh, the Glanfathans and their nearby ruins. Hadrit's knights and their supporters wanted to keep the peace, but a group of misfits with more an anarchic leanings that had formed in town wanted to go after the tribes the same way they'd gone after their lord. Soon the villagers were fighting with each other as much as with the Adrians. Or Adri Adri Adrians. <laughs> In the end, memories of the broken stone war and the war of black trees were fresh enough that the duck's soldiers won the day. I'm going to assume that's duke's soldiers, but, you know. Most of the other villagers came around eventually, but some of the core troublemakers left to join the front lines of the War of Defiance. And others, I've heard, found their way into the Guided Compass, the most forward-looking of the Glanfathan tribes. I don't know if I believe that part myself, but it makes a good story. I want to hear about the Broken Stone War. Tell me about the War of Black Trees. Farewell. Farewell. 
Well, there was a place next door. I think the leather guy's next door to the inn, from what the guy was saying. I like how the music's still playing, you can hear it faintly inside. That's fragrant. Triggle's house, which apparently smells of dead deer and deer shit, I think he said. I can't find it anywhere, Nev. We'll talk about this later, get back to the dyes, and we'll take care of our customer. Good day to you. A sturdy, broad-shouldered man wipes his hands on his slacks. He reeks of the same foul compound wafting from the vats, and his arms are stained with dye. You're looking to purchase some leather? Uh, what can you tell me about Ellis Harond? He shrugs. Only that her father's men have been banging down doors and stirring up trouble looking for her. I've never met her myself. Rumbald mentioned something about an ogre. He's hardly talked about anything else since those pigs of his went missing. The whole town's been worried about the monster people are starting to see shapes in their windows at night, hearing its growl and the snoring of their mates. It would put a lot of minds to ease if someone got rid of it. What is, uh, what's in the collapsed tower? It's collapsed. Nothing. He rolls his eyes and shrugs. A few hides on stretching racks and the tallow stench dangler's always grumbling about. The rest of the keep's dust, just like the fool lady Thanu who tried to hold it. There's a bard at the inn who'll tell you the whole blazing story if you want to hear it. What do you got for sale? Oh, nice. Got weapons as well. Can I... Oh, hello. I've got quite a lot of money now. <laughs> Must have sold some decent stuff. Or picked up a lot of coin. One-handed dagger. Bein hide armor, eighteen hundred. It doesn't seem to have anything great on it, though. It just seems to be average defense and nothing else. You must be able to upgrade this stuff, surely. Increase critical hit damage. Why would you do that? Oh, on you, I guess. <laughs> oh, regeneration on troll hide belt. Recovery speed on the other one's minus 25, but it's probably because it's lighter armor, maybe. Don't 
don't think I've got anyone using daggers, have I? I'm going to try this, I think. I'm going to try retraining him and see what happens. Well, I'll tell you what we can do. We can save it and then we can try it. Yes, it does not let me change what I am, does it? Just the points. Right, well, it was worth trying. So it's only the points you can do, and it costs you 500. Good grief, come on. <laughs> it's not going to win the awards of fastest loading game, is it? Stay out of my private quarters, that goes for you and Harren's bootlickers. Yeah. I'm not one for chit chat, blah. Dyes filled the wooden vats. A smell of dung and plant matter. Right, very well. I put my belt on as it happens. That I've just bought from him. What a, if that works, the regeneration belt, I assume it's health regeneration with a bit of luck. Then I might go... Well, no, he didn't have another one, did he? He might, he might respawn another one and buy another one off him. You never know. the tower oh no it's not just in a full circle aren't we Well, that's a... Oh, hello. Takes us out, I assume.
Gods keep you. A young woman leans against a wagon, one arm and one side of her face are covered in bandages with raw, rippled flesh showing underneath, a minty, tangy scent wafts from her dressing. She smiles painfully, just ventured into town, and about to dry on some of my stocks, but you're welcome to have a look and see. Actually, we're looking for a missing woman. Uh, what's wrong with her? She tugs at a bandage. No offence, but I hardly know you. I'm not one for gossip, and I certainly don't want to cause the poor girl any trouble. Lord Harren said she was ill from travel. That weren't no road sickness, trust me. I know it when I see it. Thanks for the information. You said your supplies are limited. Why? It's the damn roads. Can't reach none of my suppliers, so I'm stuck with whatever I scrounge up in the wood. Dire cap, river reed, and the like. That's well and good, but most potions require something stronger too. Troll skin, vessel bone, what have you. And then there's the really rare ingredients, things you've never heard, uh, be able to afford, let alone find on your own. What did you find? And Dino winces as the rest of the story comes tumbling out of her. I've been keeping an eye on the Drake's Nest east of town, at Dyerford Crossing. The beast stayed just long enough to lay a clutch and moved on. Thank the Sky Mother. It wasn't a full-grown dragon. She looks at her bandaged arm and grimaces. Fresh eggs are much more useful than the ones that get passed between merchants or left in nests for weeks or more. And that clutch looked to be at its peak. Though I'd see about getting an egg, but I didn't realise so many of them had already rat hatched. Or well, that young worms were so territorial. I could get an egg for you. She keeps her gaze steady, but she, you see hope kindling in her eyes and twitching at the corner of her mouth. I sure hope you're not leading me on. I don't think I could stand getting burned again. She bites her lip. If you really mean to go, if, go after it, I'd certainly pay you. Just remember, big as they are, dragon eggs are fragile, and there's a lot more I can do with a whole one. Tell me about the dragon egg. It's in a nest. It's in a nest is perched in a cliff on the east end of Dyerford Crossing. That's out in the wilds, just east of here. I'm sure there are others elsewhere, but the one at Dyerford Crossing is just the age I need. If you head out that way, be careful. The place was crawling with worms when I went out there, and I can't imagine they've gone anywhere else. How did you get burned? She turns her face to the ground. By the flame, how bad does it look? Terrible, I know it. It looks like it hurts. Relax, it's not that bad. I'm surprised you'd go out in public like that. <laughs> Who cares how it looks? What matters is that you're okay. I just wanted to know what happened. Uh, who cares what how it looks? Yeah. Suppose you're right. Good thing I know my pulstices. What's wrong with the roads? A noise of disgust rattles in her throat. Brigands, looters, you name it. The gods may be how hollowing out our babies, but it's grown folk that's rubbing our, out the rest of us. People are scrambling to Divine's Bay because they hear there's healthy births there, and all those refugees in abandoned homes attract desperate sorts like flies on dog shit. Show me your wares. grieving mother. This middle-aged peasant woman is dressed in a brown leather cloth draped down to her knees. Her hands are working at separating stringy colourless vegetables in a pile before her, stripping the heads off the long fibrous stems with a paring knife. She discards the stems one by one, placing the heads of the vegetables in a small cradle-like basket in front of her. She doesn't greet you as you approach. You are not sure she even knows you're there. Excuse me. 
The woman doesn't respond. She keeps stripping the heads off the vegetables at a steady rhythm. She may be deaf. There's no indication she hears you. Study the woman. At first glance, she seems to be nothing more than a middle-aged woman, unremarkable, maybe less stern than most, who seems more focused on the weaving in her lap than her surroundings. Yet, you suddenly notice she's not stripping the vegetables before her any longer. She's weaving, and the vegetable pots are now missing. She still pays you no mind, her, blown lo her brown locks torn and snagged from lack of washing. Like many of the townsfolk you've seen, there is a strange blur to her. Even the motions of her hands seem to be playing with the threads of the lack of colour in a shape that lacks interest. It may be that she is half-minded or deaf, but something feels wrong as you watch her knitting taking, it takes on an odd cadence. And you have a terrible suspicion that something looks beneath what your eyes are showing you. Her brown hair is long, almost impossibly to the length of her hands. And you follow the streams of her locks downward. The hairs become long and black, splitting off into the threads of black and silver and wrapping around her hands. She is forming a soul cradle with her threads, braiding a net in front of you, each finger long and sharp like a series of knitting needles, almost hypnotic. The silver and black strands of her hair weave together with silver predomin predomin predominating as highlight, the black shadowing it. Oh, goodness sakes. And suddenly you are calm. You are on a plateau, almost the height of the tower, several stories high. The plateau is like a table lying beneath a clear sky. And beneath the plateau, surrounding it in all directions, a forest. Hazy with mist, although whether it is actual mist or distance or a recollection. Or a re a yes, re Resting in the curve of a natural arc above you is great copper bell. Half again the size of a man, hanging at attention. As if looking down on you and their event unfolding before you. The plateau has soaked in the sun and the rock beneath you is rough and warm. The sky forms a cradle around you. The you feel different, not disembodied, but you feel your body, your physical contours have changed along with the surroundings. And you hear a soft series of chimes like wind chimes. At the sound, the scene gains colour and texture as if the sound is beckoning you gently forth. Filling your senses and thoughts like mist rolling softly into sealed chamber. And focus on the chimes. The chime coaxes you deeper into the memory and you're certain it is a memory, a warm one. You are on the stone of the plateau, your knees on the warm texture of the ground, silver white shimmering like Adra. The plateau is formed of it, glistening in the sun. You can feel the heat on your skin, your wrists and your hands. Your hands are in motion. Weaving. Not thread, but gathering, tenderly moving along the first movements of Barath's wheel. Your hands are wet. Your hands are upon the flesh of a newborn child. And you can feel the crowning of a tiny head turning in your grip. Its head slick, wet from the womb. The hand you are wearing, inhi inhabiting, have done this many times, and they are practised and confident. You can feel distant pains in your own head as... The head emerges, a stream of fluid from the womb helping the newborn slide forth, and a woman laboured, breathing, crying out. Focus on the child, the movement of your hands. As your hands move, you hear the sound of chimes clear cutting through the haze of memory. You cannot see where they are coming from, but they are close, and they are meant as comfort. Of that you are certain. Draw the child forth. And coaxed by your hands, every movement causing the chimes to sound again, almost eagerly the child comes forth. And, is and as it does, your hands are in motion, weaving, weaving, moving along the length of the soft wet rope. No, an umbilical cord from the legs of the naked woman before you. You are holding a small child, still wet from the womb before you. The child cries out, its cry full of life, full of soul, the ringing of chimes echoing in its thoughts, filling it with its welcome. The soul is blurred at the edges as if you are weaving, uh, you are viewing a soul. From within a soul, but it is there. It is alive. The woman before you is we weeping. And at her first cry, her hands reached out for it. Surrender the child. 
You surrender the child to her, something you have done many times before, and as your hands move, the chimes echo the movement, and you realise the chimes are hanging from the cords of your wrists. And where once they echoed in the memory, they are now echoing in the child's mind as well. The chimes are intended to welcome the child to be its first gentle greeting into the world, a soothing sound guided by the tender motions of your wrists. You are helping to weave its thoughts, its perceptions, and the experience. The experience. The woman laughs with a ragged joy, laughing from a parched throat. Her emotions seem soothed, but the physical demands of labor have left her exhausted. But the child is here, the child is safe, and all atop the plateau is peaceful, calm, distant, flattening out as the memory persists. Slowly pull back, retreat from that memory. With effort, the scene bleeds of colour and your mind becomes your own again. There is no pull, no anchor, yet the sound of the chimes remains. As they existed in the memory, they sound here as well, and they are hanging from woven braids on the wrists of the woman before you. Even your hands in sp is there. Even your head is spinning from the touch of her mind, and sound of the chimes on her wrists is sharp and clear, as if coaxing you back to the real world. The woman still sits before you, but she is nothing like what you saw before. She is wearing black shredded garments that drape over her form like streamers. Her hair is streaks of black and run through with silver. Her age is almost impossible to tell. She simply feels old, like a crumbled watchtower. As she lifts her head to face you, you see that her hair is draped across the front of her face like a veil. Grieving mother. What you first saw of her was a mental glamour of some sort, unconscious, and you realise what you see is what the world sees, and you are perhaps the first to see her true self. Still, you don't sense a threat in the realisation. If anything, you feel a sense of relief from the figure. You can hear her thoughts, and she is glad to, last, to at last see you. What did you do to me? I am seen, but the eyes of others do not remember. You were the first to see me as I am, the call stripped aside. There is a light touch on your mind, a caress, and her left hand mirrors the motion of the, of the touch, reaching up to the air between you. You hear the chime on her wrist sound softly, her hand moves as if pantomiming, resting on your cheek at a distance, and she speaks softly and slowly. Your memories... A cadence of wheels on a caravan track. Fever. Questions by running water. Violence in a night's campfire. Arrows in the dark. And fleeing. Falling rock and cracking stone. And a storm. The storm. The storm that brushed you. Did its screaming wake you from your mind's cradle? Your memory of it is painful. Its cry is difficult to ignore. It's like a child. Many children crying out. I encountered a biowack, yes, and it did something to me. We were attacked in the woods as we were on our way to Gilded Vale. Be cautious what you read in my mind without my leave. What happened between us on that plateau memory we shared. Her hand withdraws shyly, a chime sounding softly once again. The woman stands uncertainly as if she has been sitting for some time. Or is too weak to bear her own weight. You notice cheekbones are tight, her face gaunt. Yet her stance is weak. She seems determined to stand before you. You are able to see me. It is almost a question. You suddenly realise she doesn't seem to know what you saw when you looked at her. The image on the plateau, yet the image was so clear, so sharp, you're surprised she didn't feel you there. See me as a rare gift. A watcher's gift. I've never been able to do that with a living person except with you. So many questions. Thoughts whirling like storm winds. That storm still roars through you. Deep 
beneath your thoughts, yet muted and secret, like an underground river. I cannot tell if it is carving new channels, or eroding what keeps your true strength buried. The fact that you could hear it at all, survive it, is something few have ever done. Your power will grow stronger with each soul you touch, as it allowed you to reach out to mine. There is a silence, and although it seems to last for but a heartbeat, in your thoughts it stretches out between the two of you like a pull between your minds. You blink, take a breath, and then you realise she wants to ask you a question, yet she uh, yet can't form the words. As if assembling them is painful, or there is simply... Uh, there simply are not enough pieces. Assemble your thoughts. Do you wish to travel with me? Ah, right. You should come with me. You can't stay here. You feel a wave of fear gusted with the strength of relief, although oddly her expression does not change. Then fear dissipates and you feel... Strength and certainty as if the plateau from her memory lies beneath you and a calm sky looks down upon you. Right, well we don't know what she is, do we? Level 4, Cypher. And what the hell does a Cypher do? Uh, well, can't lose him or him. I'm Torren, people. Torren. We could lose Durance for a bit, I guess. You walk your path, I'll walk mine. Let's see what she's like. Ah, interesting. What are we doing? <laughs> there she is. Seems to be... Yeah, she seems to be a sort of daggery person, doesn't she? Yeah. Dagger and bow. Right, got a new person. Nice, there's loads of... It seems to be a game that's actually built around having shed loads of different people you can have in your party. Loads of different... You can hire them from inns and do all sorts of stuff with them. Let's have a look on the map and see where we're at here. This episode's gone on for over an hour now, but I realise it's been a slightly slower one, but... It is what it is, y'all. And I think for the people that are following this particular playthrough I think it's probably your cup of tea anyway I hope my reading isn't too awful for you but hopefully it'll stop you having to read all the text right we'll go back to the bridge at the very least and tell these guys the girl went the other way How do you do? Uh, found near for yet? I'm ready to get out of here. Uh, lie. She snuck out the back of the inn and went north. He squints at you, pulling the grass into two flimsy threads. Did she know? And how would you have known that? 
I was just hoping you'd believe me. Oh dear. <laughs> this could be a fight, couldn't it? Ledrith draws his blade. Don't worry, I'll catch up to her. Right now, I'll take care of you. All right, let's finish with a fight, people. <laughs> get my ass added to me here. Right, who are we on? Let's get our major out of harm's way, please. And... And I think she was an out of the way person actually, you know, I think about it. Autopause, character death. Boar companion, oh, alright, it was the... I don't know what that was, to be fair. <laughs> well, she lasted a long time, didn't she? Action. A thousand copper. Great sword, which is of no use to anybody. Two handed war boat. Stilettos. Fine. Uh, brigandine. Heavy armor. Medium armor. what these people have got on already I have to check well that went okay it was better than the last fight <laughs> uh. I mean he's just standing in his standard gear and I've recovery speed 30 so it's really it's the speed of recovery against the actual damage resistance isn't it fine leather armor it's the same as what she's wearing already isn't it just looks different I think Yeah. 
Oh, actually, that, that one's got speed recovery of 20, so it's better. Yeah. No point to most of it, I'm afraid. Everything I'm picking up is just not great, is it? Seventeen to twenty-six on the war bow, as opposed to twenty-one to thirty on that. It's slightly better. Right. Okay. Well, we got that done. Uh, nosy about. people oh there's a temple there as well it's all those yellow folk in it We've still got the troll to try and sort out in this area. Let's have ourselves a look in here before we move on. You must be wanting Bodmar. He's out of town. I'm just keeping the candles lit until he gets back. Seemed reasonable. Flames dance amidst scattered offerings, keys, coins, and blah. Well, that was exciting. So we can go over the other side of the bridge. Um, I'm assuming we can go back. Slightly concerned about our new party member. She seemed awfully weak in that battle. Might have to move her over to her bow. Yeah, she's got something on her as well, as it happens. I think we need to have a little camping moment. People can afford to are fleeing. Used to be a castle here. We tore it down during the revolution. Talking about our revolution. Alright, well, I think we've covered pretty much all this area. Save our campfires and have a little kip in here, I think, would be the wisest idea. How do you do? Uh, old stables. <laughs> Why not? Seems reasonable.
Awesome. So I think if you pay more, you'll get a special perk as you camp, which you don't get in the stables, because you wake up with a stiff neck, <laughs> or something like that. Okay, folks, so I'm going to save it there, and then in the next part, we shall try and hunt down the ogre, and follow the roads elsewhere. We've got a couple of quests to do. We need to find this girl as well. So I'm going to have a little nosy around. We did ask most of the villagers. I'm not sure that we actually gained any more knowledge about that, but uh, perhaps one of you fine people might know. We shall need to read our... We shall need to read our journal, I think. Find out what was happened. It has been an honour and a privilege serving for you in this slower, but nonetheless enjoyable, episode of Pillars of Eternity. And I shall see you all in part 11, folks. Take it easy. Bye.